possible. Welcome to day three of the International Conference on Science Advice to Governments. Today's overarching theme is Evidence and Democracy, Sustaining Trust in a Challenging World, and speakers will take a critical look at the different practices and principles that should support trust and legitimacy in knowledge to policy systems. The first plenary of the day is Science Policy Society, Virtuous Cycle, and is presented by the National Research Council of Canada. Our panelists will examine our current systems of science advice and consider any assumptions we might be making about the robustness of our mechanisms and structures. Please welcome the moderator of this session, Vladimir Susha, Senior Policy Advisor at UNESCO and former Director General of the European Commission's Joint Research Center. The panelists are Roger Pilquet, Professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and lead of the Evaluation of Science Advice in a Pandemic Emergency Project. Jean-Philibert Senguimana, Managing Director of the Commons Project Foundation and former Rwandan Minister of Youth and Information, Communication and Technology. Kira Matisse, Associate Head of the Division of Public Policy at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Maria da Graça Carvalho, Member of the European Parliament for Portugal, former Minister of Science, Innovation and Higher Education. Dr. Sucha, you may now begin. Thank you, grand merci. <clears throat> C'est grand plaisir d'être avec vous. Hello, it's a great pleasure to be with you for this uh, bilingual discussion. However, I will continue in English uh, since uh, it is uh, our common language for the conference. Dear colleagues, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where, where you are. And, and also the panelists are covering all those uh, mornings, uh, afternoons, and evenings uh, in, in their places where they are. So they were introduced. So just let me say a few words uh, what is expected from this uh, wonderful uh, panel. Nothing less than just to see what is going to happen in the future. What we need to do, how we need to predict uh, what will be the future of science advice. Uh, because as it was mentioned in the introduction, we have certain systems which are working, but they are working in the good times. And I think that already COVID was showing that not always uh, we are facing uh, good times. And uh, uh, if we take it seriously, what is, uh, what is happening, that we have a huge impact uh, uh, coming from artificial intelligence uh, and the transformation of society, which is linked to artificial intelligence. And we have uh, the climate crisis and both of those drivers are going to change profoundly our societies. So, and it's not going to be without any risk. There is a big risk and we need to assess this risk. We need to understand what is, what is likely to happen and how scientists are going to get ready for those changes and for those hard, difficult times where the science advice, science, um, science uh, capacity to transform the science into policy advice will be will be extremely extremely important so then uh, as mentioned we have uh, four distinguished panelists and i will uh, ask them to introduce uh, uh, their thesis their approach to to this uh, uh, vision for future of scientific advice uh, and uh, I will start to giving the floor to Kira and uh, uh, afterwards uh, Phil, and then we will, we will continue. Kira, over to you. Thank you, Vladimir. I'm so, so happy to be here virtually, though very sad not to be in, in Montreal in actuality. I'm still here in Hong Kong, 18 months and counting. So we're thinking tonight about, or like, for me tonight, for you this morning maybe, uh, about how can we think about our systems of science advice in the future? And I actually want to start by going a little bit into the past. And I want to go back, I'm in Hong Kong, and I want to go back to 2003 when a mysterious disease emerged in Guangdong province and Hong Kong was thrown into a, a crisis, right? SARS came, uh, people fell ill, they died, schools closed, and the Hong Kong government did not have a structure of permanent science advice to draw on. 
And the response to SARS uh, starting in about 2004 was to totally restructure uh, its, its public health system to be much more responsive to crisis, which included having both standing committees of, of independent science advisors, right, academics and experts and practitioners from the medical sphere on a variety of issues, constantly feeding into public health decisions, and then also uh, to have a, a system of response in case of crisis. And that is what got activated in 2020. And one of the things I think that's interesting in Hong Kong and, and for this panel in general is that, well, most people may realize that in 2020, Hong Kong government's, uh, the society's trust in the Hong Kong government was at historic lows. The next lowest point was in 2003 during SARS. So a lot of the responses that were designed in 2003 were designed during a period of low trust in government in order to figure out what is the role of science advice in a response that allows society to trust in the policy, even if they don't trust in the government, right? To, to really kind of bridge that gap. And what we've had in Hong Kong is we have this structure that really relies on actually here, literally the, the heroes of SARS, that it relies very heavily on the reputations of a handful, a handful of experts in any given field. Because Hong Kong, of course, we are quite small. We're only seven and a half million people. Um, and so this so far has led to a more robust system uh, for, for science advice, for response, but it's also led to some rather interesting roles for, for these independent scientists, especially the emergence, kind of the emergency pandemic uh, expert group, which is only about it's three scientists at the moment. And they are, they are becoming an interface between society, between the public and the government. And it's actually not clear what their advice is to government, but it, they do make consistent public statements. They're involved with both government press conferences, but they're also very involved with questioning sometimes policies so, or suggesting policies. So we call them uh, our trial balloons, right? Because they can get away with suggesting something potentially unpopular where the government could not. And so we see this interesting, very personality-based, I mean, these people have, you know, very strong scientific credentials. And what this pandemic is testing is, you know, is this robust enough? And how does it play out over a long period of time? Because issues like climate crises and issues like, you know, AI governance and so on and so forth, they're not something that's going to come hit for three months and go away. And so one of the issues that we're starting to see emerge is that people, you know, are slowly seem to be losing a little bit of patience with, with this model and that there's only so much they can do, right? So when it was masks, okay, when it's vaccines, it starts to get trickier. And so, you know, I, I think this leads to some questions about what it takes. And in the background, we do have these standing committees with broader membership, but they have kept an incredibly low pro profile. Right, so the government doesn't lean on its kind of standing set very much in the case of crises. And so I think that the case of Hong Kong, it really opens up both the, the idea that at least in a society where the experts and expertise still maintains a great deal of trust with the public, how far that can go to counter for low trust in government. And what kind of science advice structures you need to be able to deal with these problems we can see coming if the public is maintaining this distance, right? If that trust isn't there and that system is at least partially uh, damaged. Um, and so these are, these are some of the questions I hope we'll kind of get towards. I don't think I have any great answers yet, but I do think there's some interesting things to learn about how we've evolved here in Hong Kong through kind of multiple low, low public trust high expert trust crises and what that implies for building a more robust future system. Yeah, absolutely. Very, very interesting, uh, Kira. What, what you're, you're, you're talking about, uh, about this dichotomy of the low trust and the high trust. And uh, obviously you're, you're painting this gloomy picture for, for a future that, uh, that this panel is very important actually, because we are about to start drafting uh, or drawing the, the picture what that that should be but at least i think that the first and important thing is uh, just to realize that we need uh, uh, a sort of new system uh, to put in place because as you said uh, sars uh, is gone 
COVID may be gone in, in, in a few months, hopefully, but the transformation of uh, society uh, by artificial intelligence and, and climate uh, crisis uh, is going to stay for a very long time. So we really need to need to see what the, what what is at stake. Let let's continue with with this uh, with this uh, uh, trust issue because I understand uh, feel that for you the trust uh, uh, in society trust as such is is a key component of of scientific advice and and all what is what is linked to this. So what uh, what, what actually you you have to say about that? Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, and bonjour, bon après-midi tout le monde. C'est vraiment une... Hello and good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be part of this panel and to discuss uh, this very important topic. I will now continue in English for the benefit of the panel. I think, Kira, you, you touched on really very important uh, aspects. And, and as you say, Vladimir, trust is important. But I think there are other two things that go with trust to make sure that the science policy society virtual cycle work and it's trust first of all but also truth and and good leadership so in my view the cycle works when policymakers trust the scientific community to provide true factual and evidence-based advice but also the system uh, assumes the presence of uh, leadership that puts public interest first it only works when communities and countries are able to foster communication, cooperation, collaboration, both domestically and internationally. So when any of the three assumptions fail, the system derails and public policy systems actually become dangerous weapons that put society and people's lives in harm's way. Uh, I think uh, the, the crisis, whether local, national or global, um, uh, provide a great environment for testing the strength and the resilience of science advice systems. So this is evidence uh, evident in multiple domains, ranging from you know the current uh, coronavirus pandemic, but also other uh, crises such as you know climate change, global trade, uh, gender equality, to uh, to to many other uh, global uh, problems. So uh, let me use the, the COVID-19, for example, to illustrate what happens when one, of, uh, one or, or more of, of those foundations in the system fail. So let me start with trust. So when the coronavirus hit China in late 2019, one of the instinctive moves that we, we saw uh, is, uh, was that countries uh, started closing their borders. So suddenly we saw that instead of working together to solve the problem, countries started seeing one another as the problem. In, re in retrospect, border closures did not succeed at stopping the, the spread of the virus. Nevertheless, I think largely for political reasons, border closings remain one of the most widely used strategies against the pandemic. So the trust deficit among nations caused untold suffering and losses to people industries and economies that depend on the good functioning of global logistic systems, travel and tourism. Um, and then we saw how lives were lost, jobs were destroyed and uh, livelihoods were, um, uh, were shattered. And then the truth part of it, I think it also goes with honesty, so some, something that is really um, rare these days. So the pandemic amplified the already looming crisis of misinformation, alternative facts and conspiracy theories. Thousands of lives and billions of dollars continue to be lost to, due to neglect of basic public health measures and vaccine hesitancy as a result. So truth is useless without adequate education and proper strategies to counter criminal use of freedom of speech. And then finally, the leadership part. So, Leadership is the ability to bring people together uh, in, a, in a community and beyond the community, bring partners together to solve a problem. So the most glaring contemporary failure of science to policy advice, in my view, can be illustrated by the current vaccine nationalism. The ongoing holding of vaccines by some countries while people are dying in, the, in others uh, does not make any scientific or even common sense. So this situation alone bring, is, brings into question 
almost all the assumptions that we make about science and uh, policy uh, advice. So let, let me pause here. Uh, I will get back uh, when I get a chance to elaborate on some of these uh, aspects, trust, truth, and leadership. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Uh, TTL, trust, truth, and leadership, and honesty, which you mentioned as well, uh, very, very important ingredients, uh, of course, of what, what, what we need to keep in mind when, when, designing, uh, when designing the future of science advice. Uh, let me remind uh, uh, everybody who is uh, watching, following this session, that uh, the session is open for comments, uh, open for questions, and, and we will be taking those questions in the, in the last part of the, of the panel. And now let me turn to, to somebody who is an embodiment of science uh, policy, uh, leadership, uh, trust, truth, uh, uh, what, all what you, what you mentioned, and that's Maria. Maria has been a minister, she has been uh, uh, in the European Parliament, she has been in research, and she also uh, is behind the, the design of, uh, of the advisory mechanism uh, uh, of the European Union and, and, and the European Commission. So then somebody who is extremely experienced in this field, and I know that the European Parliament is uh, uh, very much attached to the to the evidence to the science. Uh, so then, Maria, how do you see the the future of of scientific advice? How we should uh, be navigating through these difficult times, uh, which are lying ahead? Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you, Vladimir, for your nice words about me. Um, I. Uh, fully agree with what has been said until now of the characteristics of the science advice system. Um, of course, we all agree on the independence and autonomy. Uh, I would add also that is important uh, the visibility with, uh, at the same time, humility, someone that is visible to the public, that is important. And uh, I fully agree with the trust the trust uh, uh, that you really get through uh, public accountability and transparency. is very important that uh, if it's a chief scientific advisor or a system, your sources are known, uh, are transmitted to the public, uh, everything that you, you, you consult, um, so that the, the, you can build a, a trust uh, with the public. Another point that still was not mentioned, but it's important, you need also the, 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 the system needs to be accepted by the final uh, political decision maker. So you really are in between the public and the, the, the policy makers or the political decision. Uh, so it's not, not a point to do a very important uh, very well known, uh, very well uh, consolidated advice, and after you don't have also the trust of the politician. So it's the trust of the public and the trust of the politician. And I would uh, put as a, a last point and probably the most difficult, uh, based on the book of Roger, that any scientific advisor should act as an honest broker of knowledge. And as he explained, uh, uh, this means uh, showing what is known and what is not known, showing the uncertainties, making the synthesis. And I think that is here, that is now, now the most difficult point. And that was, this was obvious in COVID, that we had uh, uh, many new evidence every day uh, and uh, there was a difficult to do the synthesis. There was contradictor, uh, contradictory information. And for example, in my own country, they had a system of um, a group of advisors, but uh, they, they had very poor synthesis and came out different opinions out of this group of advisors. And that it's very important that there is uh, a synthesis but of course saying what if there were disagreements if there is a degree of uncertainties and what is already known or not known uh, and this is the part that we need to work for the future because it's almost in, uh, is a, a very difficult task taking consideration the exponential 
uh, growth of uh, uh, publications and data uh, in any relevant field nowadays. And probably there, um, um, things like the artificial intelligence can help us uh, on making this synthesis, something that we should discuss. Another point that I would add, and that I felt it very important uh, in the European system, and I want to take the opportunity to say that Europe has been always, since the existence of the European project, uh, um, uh, science-based and uh, very uh, all the decisions based on very scientific evidence with the uh, um, uh, impact assessment, uh, but the system has uh, uh, changed along the times. Uh, in the beginning, we had mainly the, the GRC that Vladimir was director general for many years, very important uh, DGICs providing uh, scientific advice. We had many uh, external panels that also uh, advised the commission. But uh, as uh, um, uh, I was a principal advisor of President Barroso, and I pushed him very much to have a chief scientific advisor. And he got a chief scientific advisor for the first time in 2012 to 2014. Uh, Professor Daman Glover was the chief scientific advisor. And why I, I felt that that synthesis was important and the visibility. That were the two uh, characteristics that I thought that on top of everything that we had already in the European Commission was an important, uh, uh, an important added value to have a chief scientific advisor. But it turned in the end that a single person was not the more adequate system for a very complex uh, uh, geography and uh, political scene in Europe. We are now, we were at the time 20, uh, 20, uh, 28, now we are 27. And the culture, uh, to be a system that is adapted to our culture is also uh, very important. So is the reason that also at the time as advisor of Commissioner Moedas and uh, it was uh, President Juncker, we proposed this mechanism that has seven uh, personalities that represents better the different cultures and the, the, the different uh, uh, geographies that we have in the European Union. And we also have the support of the European Academy. So also these characters of the uh, adequation to the, the cultural system uh, that is part of the acceptance by the public, uh, uh, it's also very important. But we lost in visibility. So the, the, when we had one chief scientific advisor, we had more visibility. So you can have advantage and the disadvantage of the two systems. But concluding for the future, we really need to work very much on the question of the synthesis of the impressive amount of uh, information and data that we have about anything that you may think you have a huge amount uh, of data and sometimes contradictory information and that is the most difficult um, probably the most difficult uh, task of the science advisor uh, mechanism over or or the person so the the okay. broke the is very important and i look forward to listen from roger on that thank you no, very much okay thank you Thank you, thank you, Maria. Yes, indeed, you, you are adding uh, synthesis, visibility, and, and the, the very important element of the knowledge management, because of, obviously in this tsunami of uh, data information and knowledge, we need to get oriented. Okay, so we kept Roger, uh, he was referred to by Maria, but he was referred to uh, also before. Uh, some uh, by, by some other speakers and, and Roger is working on a very interesting project actually um, which can help us to understand what these elements of the future design of, uh, uh, of of the science advice in, in difficult time in hostile time uh, in, in hostile um, environment envir political environments uh, could be so Roger now over to you Thank you, Vladimir. Congrats to INSA for hosting this meeting. And uh, science advice has never been more important, obviously, to the world. And uh, I'm going to share some of the 
Emerging Lessons from the Escape Project, which is Evaluation of Science Advice in a Pandemic Emergency. Um, a lot of what we're learning, um, our community has well known for many years, um, but we have a shared body of, of expertise uh, developing in the pandemic because even though people are experiencing the pandemic in different ways around the world, we're all in a pandemic. And that is uh, providing us with an opportunity to raise some important questions. Um, I'm just gonna go through some, some top line um, lessons that are emerging from, from the project. We have 17 countries on every continent around the world. Um, about half of our case studies are in now. Uh, we expect to have them all in by January. Our first papers will start to appear in the coming month or so. Um, but let me just go through and then I'll highlight what I think are some of the, the cross-cutting issues. Um, so we've seen instances where uh, politicians have ignored advice. Um, and Chile is an example of that. No one will be surprised that politicians occasionally ignore ad advice. Um, we've seen instances where uh, experts uh, and expert bodies don't integrate knowledge in advice. And the big, the big cleavage point is between public health and economics. Um, and the UK is, a, is an excellent example. The SAGE committee in the UK um, has focused on public health um, and left economics advice elsewhere. Um, we've seen uh, inappropriate expertise. So we see policymakers receiving expertise on public health um, and medical advice, but what really politicians may need is uh, information on society, uh, more in the social sciences or in the humanities. And Italy is a good example of an expert body that did not um, focus on um, social science and humanities, even though the Italian government has that capacity. They just didn't put that together. Um, as Kira said, there are good examples of trusted advice. Um, and often this comes from experience with past crises. Um, and the SARS example in Asia is particularly notable because it led to the establishment of a number of institutions, but also brought experts together with policymakers and created a bond of trust that has carried over to COVID. Um, in other situations, we see where experts aren't trusted and, and what that can uh, lead to. Um, one of the most remarkable stories for me um, is the lack of expert advice at the highest levels of the US government. Remarkably, um, there is no high level expert body in the United States that might be parallel to the SAGE, um, which has led to what I call a, a science advice and pseudoscience advice free for all, which is remarkable. Um, let me talk just quickly about some cross-cutting issues. And I wanna focus um, the remainder of my, my couple minutes here on, um, on us as experts and experts on expertise and advice, um, because we can't control what politicians do, but we certainly can control what we do. We see among experts um, instances of self-advocacy. So experts saying the science says you must do this. Um, we see experts using their position um, in formal advisor roles for open advocacy, um, somehow thinking that they've been appointed to some policymaking role rather than an, an, an advisory role. Um, we see politicians seeking to avoid accountability by uh, putting responsibility for decisions on experts um, and experts accepting that rather than pushing back. Um, we see conflation of roles and responsibilities and a lot of expert bodies have what I would call and this is a nerdy term, but improper or ill-defined terms of reference. So it's not clear what their engagement responsibilities actually are. Um, and we see a lot of conflicts of interest um, among experts in providing advice. Um, one issue that has emerged pretty much everywhere is, is what we're calling in the project shadow science advice. Um, these are the rise of experts and expert bodies outside of formal governmental systems um, who seek to either contest or counter or complement um, governmental systems, but this has led to a much more um, fractured and complex environment of advice. Um, and then let me just say that the, the, the WHO origins investigation um, is a perfect example. It's a multilateral institution, obviously, um, which probably would have benefited from expertise on advice in the constitution of that initial Committee. Um, the second go round looks like they're doing a little bit better, but um, it's clear that the, that the expertise that's represented in INCSA um, needs to be better integrated into advisory systems. So we need better advice on advice. 
Um, let me just end with three quick questions. Um, and these are questions for us. So what criteria should an expert use when deciding whether to assume a, a supportive role um, of expert governmental advisory system or an oppositional role? Um, in the Netherlands, um, a, a shadow science advisory team was um, organized. They started countering the government and then they disbanded and said, we can't help. And we're actually um, potentially harming uh, the government. Um, do we want as experts to delegitimize democratic governments? Um, is, that, is that a proper role for us? Um, should we first seek to improve existing expert advisory bodies before we jump so quickly to go to the media and create alternatives? Um, do we need to develop ethical guidelines for providing advice um, and create a set of norms in our community um, so that we have a shared understanding? I mean, it's pretty clear to me looking at the pandemic, we don't have a shared understanding of what it means to be uh, an effective ethical advisor, um, similar to what public health does uh, for doctors and so on. Um, so obviously there's a lot to talk about and a lot to discuss, but those are some of the top line issues uh, emerging from our project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roger. I think that, um, that you, you um, very well uh, outline many many issues, many problems, uh, uh, and uh, you know all, all three questions you you asked uh, at the end are very pertinent, and I, I would uh, love to have time to uh, that that we can dig to them. But I think that we can we can somehow keep this in mind in the, in the conclusion of this panel that these are really issues which we need to which we need to keep in mind. So then. Um, uh, uh, some time ago, I think that uh, this year it will be uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, there was uh, um, two people who, were, who started to talk about, um, about uh, something which is called um, uh, something, something uh, uh, which is called post-normal science. Uh, and they have been, and I don't think that we, I don't know to what extent you are aware of this, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's the system uh, which fits perfectly to the time of COVID, where we have very little knowledge, the stakes are very high, time is short. And uh, uh, I don't think that we, we fully, after all these 30 years, incorporated these bright uh, uh, ideas into, into our, our system. There, there is something they are calling for, it's extending uh, peer community. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm just uh, curious, what do you think? To what is uh, to what extent? Uh, because we should not be uh, separating science advice from uh, citizens' civic engagement, uh, uh, engaging with people. Is that uh, and that that's my my question to all of you. Is that something uh, we should be considering this uh, extended peer community as it was as it was. Uh, uh, mentioned by Silvia Funtovic and Jerome Ravet some some years ago, uh, should we be working with citizens? Should uh, uh, the citizen engagement be integral part of uh, of our uh, our advice mechanism in the future? Just to be able to create this trust, which was mentioned by all of you uh, in in, um, uh, in in your comments. So, who, who would like to to react to to this? Uh, feel free to, uh, to to jump in. Maybe we can start with with you, Roger. Uh, you you ended ended up uh, so then we can start with you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, actually, the um, you know my book, The Honest Broker, is an exploration of post normal science um, and and how we experts function in that environment. And the extended peer community includes people who are certainly credentialed experts. Um, but as you mentioned, there are people who have expertise, but they don't have credentials. And building legitimacy in democratic systems um, means engaging the extended peer community and engaging the public um, and taking their views seriously. Um, we have seen in the United States uh, how easy it is to destroy trust in public expert bodies. So the U.S. Centers for Disease Control um, and many people have seen uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci on TV and seen him in the news. Um, that has become a politicized body in the eyes of the public. And we've seen a, a rapid diminishment of trust. Uh, and so creating institutions that can engage 
outside expertise, but also the general public. And then you know, what we might call lay expertise are absolutely essential to building legitimacy. Um, and I don't think that we fully um, grappled with that challenge in the, in the pandemic in most places. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, who else would like to, uh, to, to chip in, Phil? Yeah, absolutely. I think Vladimir, the question of pause is, is uh, really a critical one because there is no question that there is a disconnect between uh, the science advice systems and, and civic engagement. And I would want to use um, an example of my own career as when I was still in government um, and being in charge of both technology and, and youth. Uh, one thing that I realized is that um, you know, politicians and the scientific community need to be proactive in engaging um, communities and especially in the, in the context of Rwanda, which is similar to many contexts in the global south. You've got this huge uh, uh, youth population that is even growing. They are digital natives. They are responsible for most of the content creation and production online. So they are huge uh, opinion leaders. Uh, opinion shapers uh, power in, in the hands of young people. And you, you realize that some of the young people actually are, carry more influence even than uh, policymakers. So the question becomes, if you don't engage, if you don't educate and inform those influencers among young people, then what do you expect their followers are going to believe? Who do you think they will follow? So I think being proactive as policymakers and as scientific community in engaging society and especially engaging young people is in my view, one of the most powerful ways uh, to really bridge this disconnect that uh, you described. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Phil, I, I think that you're absolutely right. And we see it, uh, uh, all these influencers on, on the other side of these anti-vaxxers and, and, and the people uh, spreading uh, uh, the, the, the different uh, different hoaxes. I, I think that's that's a, that's a really issue. And, and I probably we should be asking ourselves, uh, couldn't we uh, somehow prevent at least part of those being derailed uh, and spreading this this false uh, false information? Absolutely agree. Uh, Maria? I also so if I chip in one second, really to, yeah. to, to recognize uh, Roger's uh, approach of, you know, pointing one finger at the politicians and others and really pointing four fingers at, our, at ourselves and really taking responsibility and doing what we can. I think that's, that's where I would have ended the, this whole conversation in looking at what we can do, uh, what is in our power to do, as opposed to just, you know, continuing sort of dictating do dogmatically uh, uh, what others should should be doing. So thank you, Roger, for that. No, I, I think that's that that's a great point. I think that's that's actually, uh, as I understand the, uh, the 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 point of of entire conference of INSA conference and this panel just to controlling what we we do uh, because this is what we can we have a full control of what we do. Maria, uh, over to you. Um, thank you very much. On the on the what uh, Roger has mentioned on the ethical guidelines, uh, for example, the the in the case of the scientific advice mechanism of the Commission, there is a secretariat in the GRDD, and they the secretariat is uh, in the first phase of the the mechanism has devoted a lot of time on writing. Uh, the procedures and the uh, uh, things about the conflict of interests, the, the, the gathering of data, the, the selection of experts, so trying to approach a, a kind of a ethical uh, principles for the, the, how the SAM uh, would function. Uh, as far as the, the consultation, um, 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 in the science advice mechanism, uh, there was, uh, and I suppose it's still the, the practice, the, the, f the, the first phase of the gathering of and, and the synthesis that is mainly done by the European academies uh, uh, with a lot of consultation. And uh, after there is a consultation on the, uh, when the opinion is, is uh, uh, formulated, is a, there is a, con a first stage of consultation with experts also with criteria of the selection of experts, and the second phase of consultation with the public at large. Uh, and there, what we can notice is that 
uh, it's a very difficult issue because the ones that respond are mainly the ones that are organized and are defending causes and sometimes causes that are not based on science. In that, it doesn't happen in all the fields, but in certain fields there are uh, this tendency that we want to try to reach the general public and uh, the ones that answer to this uh, call are the ones that are organizing and defending certain uh, uh, causes that uh, in certain way are biased for, and is not relevant to, to, to the work of the science advice. And that is a difficult uh, uh, issue all to deal with. Uh, with. So it is a, a difficult that we have in this re re relation with the general public how to avoid this um, uh, these movements that are more common nowadays and we could see for example the anti-vaccine movements okay thank you thank you maria and uh, kira i, I want to come back to this you know question about participation and, and extended peer communities and consultation because i think even before COVID, with science advice systems, I mean, Roger mentioned, you know, often missing pieces of expertise, right, from social sciences and humanities, but even more deeply, the idea that somehow technical answers about what is likely to happen given a particular policy or, you know, definitions of particular problems, taking precedence over understanding the values in any given community or society about the trade-offs, where the values lie, and, and these, you know, kind of softer questions. But, you know, you know, I'm a policy professor. One of the things I'm constantly telling my students is that I can get all the science in the world and I can tell you the impact of this policy will reduce this problem by X percent. But is that enough? Is it worth it? Is that what we want to spend our money on? Is, is you know, going to zero COVID, you know, worth the, the lockdown, the impacts on children's schooling and work and livelihoods and putting particular groups at risk while, while protecting others. These, these social values aren't, you know, th this is where you really need much more participation because when people know that these value judgments are being made for them under the guise of science, they stop trusting the science, right? And, and I think there is sometimes a tendency amongst experts to conflate their science. I mean, this is the issue advocate kind of issue to conflate your kind of judgment about what the right thing to do is with the science and not do that next step of engagement. And, you know, if I can point to something where I think that good things are happening around kind of climate, it's much more engagement, at least at kind of local and community levels around futures and foresights and trying to figure out what this future is we're going to try to make, not just doubling down on, oh, we need to get, you know, X, Y, or Z clean energy technology. Right. And that kind of broader engagement and trusting in civil society to have something important to say with the experts, educating each other and putting the values and the expertise together, I think is extremely important and not necessarily well built into our current mechanisms of science advice all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I fully agree that, that I think that what we are witnessing with, uh, with the public engagement in, in a climate issue, I think that should be an, an, a good example, which is happening on its own uh, without actually scientists and science advice being, uh, being behind that. We have, we have one question which, uh, which actually is uh, touching on what, what we have been discussing and it's from Naomi Simon Kumar. And uh, uh, the, the question is about uh, this um, uh, shadow or uh, alternative uh, advisory mechanisms, uh, to what extent they are uh, delegitimizing uh, the, the existing gov governance structures and, and how this is uh, contributing in, in, in the trust or how it is eventually lowering the trust or determining trust. So, I, we, so just being... Uh, um, yeah, being aware of, of the time we have, uh, uh, so we have, we have time for maybe one reaction. Who would like to, to react to this? Uh, maybe we can go to Roger because he raised this issue. Yeah, I'll just uh, speak quickly. I mean, I mean, my my escape project is an exercise in shadow science advice. We're, we're, no one appointed us, no one asked us, and we're giving advice on advice. And so shadow science advice, the, 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 the phrase shadow science advice is taken from um, parliaments where you have a, a loyal opposition. And the idea of shadow science advice is um, that experts can, can want to make things better but be outside the system. 
one thing we've learned in the pandemic is that not every expert wants to make things better. Some want to acquire power, some want to oppose the government. Um, some have very strong views that the policies in place aren't working. So this is something where I think we have to have a, a more open discussion about our roles and responsibilities um, and be willing, and again, I'll pick on the United States. Um, there are some experts in the United States who I think have been very harmful to public outcomes in the pandemic. And I think we experts have to be able to identify those situations where we are helping um, and contributing to, to positive democratic outcomes and those situations where we're not. Um, and, and that's a, a difficult thing to do in, in an, any community, but I think uh, the pandemic shows that shadow science advice is sometimes beneficial and sometimes not, and we have to know the difference. Hmm. No, ab absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Roger. And uh, uh, let me, in, in this last minute, uh, to, to sum up, I think that we agreed on on uh, importance of trust and we see how the low trust, high trust uh, dichotomy is working in, in some, some cases and if, if, how, how it is not working in some cases. And, and I think that uh, the project, this SK project which, which Roger was, uh, was introducing, I think this is a sort of uh, window to the future, the window which is learning from the lessons of COVID uh, and showing what uh, uh, we might be witnessing in, in the future. And I think that, uh, uh, in the line what you said, Rogers, controlling what we do, I think that INSA should be engaging uh, and uh, uh, really taking into account uh, 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 what are the, the, those criteria where we are uh, supporting the formal mechanisms and, and existing mechanism and then we are opposing them. When, when there is a legitimacy for uh, the scientific voice to be, uh, to be somehow heard, uh, uh, and when to be voiced, and what are the ethical ethical criteria? And definitely, this kind of political agenda or uh, the the advocacy, etc. What is happening very often with the scientists should be avoided, and at least we should put a certain framework into in, into this. And I think that that can be a, an excellent uh, work for for Inksa. And, and from, from uh, my side, that, that would be a sort of uh, a message from this panel that let's work on those criteria, let's work on those frameworks, uh, because this is going to happen anyway. And it's, it's better to be ready and it's better to, to somehow um, create this ethical, ethical framework before, before it's too late and before the science is, uh, is creating more harm than, than good uh, for society. So many thanks to distinguished panelists, many thanks for your engagement, many thanks for sharing your knowledge and, and many thanks to INSA and all those uh, uh, many people in Canada, Montreal, Auckland, uh, New Zealand, everywhere who, who have been uh, working on the success of this biggest uh, hybrid event as we learned at the beginning. So once again, many thanks and uh, good continuation of this wonderful event. All the best. And many thanks to you, moderator and panelists, but also to the National Research Council of Canada for making this plenary possible.